Hello and welcome to In Search of Purpose with Sal Hamley. Hi, we have Tim McGarry on the show today. Uh, this is In Search of Purpose with Sal Hamby, and I would like to uh, lead over to Tim just to explain a little bit about what you do, who you are, and all the rest. Hi Sal, how are you? Pleasure you. to be on your podcast, by the way. Uh, in Search of Purpose seems very deep and meaningful, and uh, I don't really do deep and meaningful. I do uh, cheap and pathetic and, you know, sarcastic <laughs> and windy and comedy rather than philosophy. Uh, I'm Maybe that is your purpose? Unaf- mm-hmm. yeah, yeah, I'm currently an unemployed comedian. Uh, if you want your windows cleaned, give me a shout. Um, I haven't <laughs> Have you, have you seen one of these before? That's called a diary. A diary. <laughs> Empty. Not a bloody thing in it. They're one of those phrases in lockdown, you know, let me check my diary. I haven't a bloody thing to do until September, I think it was the earliest. Apart from talk to me. Apart from talk to me. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so yes, you're an Irish comedian and actor, Tim. Uh, tell us a bit about what it was like growing up uh, in North Belfast, um, in the heart of the Troubles. Tell us a bit about that. Oh, the well, heart of the Troubles, you make me sound very old, but I am, I suppose I am. Well, I was born in 1964, so uh, I was at school during most of the of the troubles, uh, 70s and 80s. They, they, they were backed up to your life, but kind of in the background. Um, I was at Queen's from 1982 to 86. Um, uh, funny, I'm, I'm a big advocate at the moment of uh, integrated education. Uh, I'm a, do a lot of work for the Integrated Education Fund, um, and partly because uh, of my experience in a very good Catholic education. There was nothing wrong with my Catholic education except a couple of things missing: girls and Protestants, both of which I found very important. Uh, no, I, I didn't know; I hardly knew any girls, and I knew no Protestants by the time I went to university in really? 1982 ridiculous you know and I knew you and it, that's one of the, the, the dividing lines of our society is still even 25 years on from the peace process it's still Catholics and Protestants and people living separately and all of that and so I've, I've, I've always been a passionate campaigner saying that we need to integrate our schools and that would solve a lot of the problems of Northern Ireland but when I was growing up I mean it was you know you could people could be go to school and never meet a, a Protestant until they're 18 or never even meet a Protestant at all because they'd be in their own areas and that you know if they didn't get a job you know uh, they could be unemployed and, and go and meet Catholics and play and go to Catholic sports and read Catholic newspapers and all on the same on the other side. So, I mean, those those days are slowly disappearing, which is good. But um, when, when I was growing up, things were a lot different. Yeah, it sounds like it. And um, I believe as well that um, you were, you, obviously the, the biggest thing that you were doing was the Hole in the Wall gang and it was the comedy group. Can you tell us a little bit about that for anybody who doesn't know or who's wanting to sort of go back into the archives and take a look? Right. Right. Well, um, I'm sort of vaguely famous in Northern Ireland, but nowhere else, you know, it's kind of like Alan Partridge. Um, I met the, at, at, at university, I met Damon Quinn and Michael McDowell, uh, and we are the whole in the wall gang. So from 1980, early 1980s, I met these guys and I still can't bloody get rid of them. But basically, <laughs> uh, after much faffing around, we became a comedy, full-time comedy group. We did radio shows, a show called The Perforated Ulster which was a sketch show, which won uh, a Sony Award way back in the early 1990s for the best comedy program in the UK. Mm-hmm. Then did a show called uh, Two Ceasefires in a Wedding, which became a sitcom called Give My Head Peace, yeah. which was the biggest sitcom Northern Ireland has ever done and still is massive. Bizarrely, it, it's, we're, we're back again doing more shows. We did and you were like, da and still are da and get called I, da oh, and well, great and everything. Yeah, I'm, I'm recognised, well, apart from during lockdown, no, even during lockdown, I'm, I'm kind of recognised every single day as da from the head. <laughs> It'll be on my headstone, just da, that's all it needs to say, because <laughs> I'm recognised everywhere in Northern Ireland as da. If I become the first Irish man in space, it doesn't matter. <laughs> my still be, where's your man da, to give me a head piece. Uh, because it was a massive sitcom, it ran for years yeah. and years, and it was off for a few years and then it came back and we're all we're all at the moment. So we would do a tour every year of Give Me Head Peace as well. And then I also do a bit of stand-up on myself. And then I'm also the chairman of the panel show called The Blame Game, which is a radio love and it. TV show. Um, Absolutely love it, yeah. I love it too. In fact, I love it so much. I'd like to be doing it right now. In fact, I should be doing it right now, except they could cancel thanks to bloody coronavirus. So we're... Oh, we're 
series with a series that was supposed to start the start of April and it's kind of been held back to whenever. Oh, I don't know. It's such a laugh out loud show, and yeah, also obviously the the tour has been cancelled, hasn't it? I mean, you did a few a few dates of the Give Me Head well, piece. I was due to go to the one in Belfast, and then they were cancelled. They were well. They were, we were quite lucky. We got most of them done in Belfast and Derry, but yeah, we we lost nine shows, and they were all sold out in advance. You know, so we lost nine shows. Um, I haven't said that. I mean, the, the, the theatres. I feel sorry for the actors. You know, I mean, I. I Doing all right. We, we we're hopefully getting more TV stuff later in the year. But you know, for actors and you know theaters and stage crew and uh, promoters and all, I mean, it's an absolute disaster. I mean, it's just your income has just been wiped out overnight, um, and it's a really really tough time. I mean, the theater show was going absolutely brilliantly. We were loving it, and then one night we were in Armagh, and instead of having a we were sold. It was supposed to be a full house, it was sold like four hundred people, but only two hundred turned up <laughs> because the fear had set in. That's and then right. the next day, the theatres just went right. That's it. We're all closing. This right. is I can remember that day. I can actually remember the day you were you were playing that or doing that that gig, and I thought, my God, no one's gonna like no one's gonna turn up for the for the wrong reasons. You know, it's it's yeah. like it's yeah. terrible. It really is. And I think probably if I had been if I had had a ticket for that one, I probably would have been the one one of the ones not going. If I'm completely well, that's that's what I mean. Yeah. And it wasn't fair. To people to say look we're we're definitely but on the other hand you know we have contractual obligation we had to turn up and do shows otherwise the theatre would go well you know we're, we've been told we're still allowed to open and all so it got complicated thankfully it all got sorted out I mean we lost nine shows and you know but we're we're it's one of those things everybody's in the same boat as the the cliche as they say uh, so everybody's been hit hard and it it's is awful because you know say say for example the coronavirus wasn't happening and one of you fell sick with the flu or something like that you know, it, it literally, how, how much money does, does one night affect all the people involved? It's literally prisons, well, isn't it? Oh, absolutely. And it's not just us as actors. I mean, there's, there's a crew as well. There's a costume designer. There's a lighting guy. There's a sound guy. There's a stage manager. There's the theatres themselves who rely on these shows coming and selling tickets, you know, and that's bar staff. And then you go into taxi drivers, bringing audience members to wow. theatres also, yeah. all sorts of yeah. You know, there are huge ripple effects of, you know, of a, of a theatre closing down and people not being able to gather. I mean, it's like the pubs as well. I mean, there are all sorts of people, you know, musicians, musicians. I mean, what, where do they play now? I know there are a lot of people playing at home, but I'm sorry, but it's just not the same. Uh, and comedy, yeah. but I know a lot of guys. I know a lot of guys are trying to do comedy from their kitchens or whatever, and I'm afraid that, you know, I'm not, I'm not being rude about other comedians who are trying, are trying to entertain people, but comedy needs an audience. Comedy needs uh, feedback and it needs That's live right. after. Yeah. Uh, and it doesn't, well, a lot of comedy doesn't really work without it. Yeah, for the energy, you know. Whereas I suppose what we're doing right now, it would be really good. Normal podcasts are across the table. You feel like you're in a radio station. You do get this sort of vibe going, but... This isn't yeah. impossible considering that a lot of radio stations, for example, ring people remotely all the time anyway. So yeah. I understand that point of view, especially when it comes to the likes of the, the comedy shows where there is like an energy built, there's a buzz, there's a vibe, and people are yeah. really buying into that. They're buying into that nearly more than what you're actually given because it's all part of a collective night out. Yeah. And one thing is when you're doing the, the, the other nine shows, I mean, you're probably your content is going to change somewhat under the current circumstances. Well, like certainly. You to yeah. Say, it? Yeah. well I, it was getting to the point where because the coronavirus was becoming so uh, dominant that, you know, our jokes about Jim Allister and Sinn Féin were becoming less and less relevant in an audience. <laughs> you're, not, you're not seeing what's going on outside there, Tim. You know. <laughs> But you're absolutely right about the personal contact as well. I mean, you're wonderful even on Zoom, of course, Sal. But I mean, if we were in a, in a room together, there would be, and it, you know, I don't have to get a theory about these things. There would be a, a kind of an energy to it. Of uh, course. Um, you know, it, 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 would be, it would be better, shall we say. It would, absolutely. It would be better. Um, so the, obviously the people who have already paid for their tickets and went to the shows that they've seen, you know, you may have to run those dates again for the additional, because obviously the content's going to be changing. So hopefully, fingers crossed, you'll get more dates out of it, not just the remaining ones. Well, well, look, well I, I, I'm not, we had nine shows that we lost. Um, I, the trouble is when, when the theatres eventually do reopen, I mean, there'll be a hell of a lot of people wanting into the theatres at the yeah. same time. So it could, be, it could be next year by the time we get back and do and then probably just do a brand new show. So we don't know. I mean, it's all, it's all up in the air at the moment, I have to say. Exactly. Um, what's your take on the whole, um, the softening of, of, without going too much into the political side of things, but even just from a, like a, a unifying point of view of, 
the people who um, are coming together north and south for the, for the better purpose of trying to just dampen down any further spread of this coronavirus and what do you think that looks um you know for the future of ireland um collectively oh you oh you we are you can't talk about that without getting political <laughs> 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 uh, and you're the man to do it you are the man well to i am the man well yeah yeah again uh boris johnson you've got to congratulate that man who managed to be on holiday during five cobra meetings and just didn't bother to <laughs> turn up for things you know i mean he is the donald trump of thing. I mean, that's unbelievable uh i i think the um you know without getting too political about it it seems logical that you know on an island that you would have yeah. one strategy because you can you know, can you can you, you can control things on an island a lot easier than you can on mainland Europe or whatever. Uh, and I think they did do this during the foot and mouth disease. If I remember correctly, you know, Ian Pizzi used to talk about you know our, our cows are British, but they you know they can be Irish as well. Uh, and I think you know a joined up approach seems absolutely logical, whether or not uh, it is feasible, given that you have. Westminster, Stormont and Dublin. I don't know, but I mean, it, it's going to be very strange if Dublin then starts to relax its... its uh, mm, yeah. Right? And up here, it's, it's not going to relax its thing. Mean, I think it's very, very... There has to be some sort of coordinated strategy, obviously. I know, and you know, it's like a cow doesn't... Uh, a cow doesn't sort of decide, oh, I'll eat that grass or I'll not eat that grass, you know. It's, yeah. it's very much a case of... You know, people just pulling together for the for the betterment. Well, more practically, if the pubs up here are closed and the pubs down south are open, I'll be down south having a pint. <laughs> <laughs> Hold it like that. <laughs> very good point. Very, That's very the one thing point. I really miss. I, well, I miss two things: football and pubs. Ah, oh, it's oh. all awful. I'm sure you miss football as well, Sal. I'm sure yeah, you totally. Oh, no, oh. not. No. <laughs> no. You know what it's like. <laughs> People going out. Oh, all this nonsense about there's a, you know, the conspiracy theories. It's all done by 5G and all oh. that. Oh, the balloon heads. Don't start Same me. Thing. Don't start me in gym core and all that nonsense. But, you know, it, it wasn't started by China. It's nothing to do with 5G. Do you know what it's all about? It's about stopping Cliftonville winning the Irish Cup. Because we were in the Irish Cup semi <laughs> And somebody in China just said this is the only way to stop Clifton Bowen in the Irish Cup. I think the so. They cancelled the entire Irish League season. That's the biggest. Look, India, that's in there. That was just. <laughs> that's like the biggest conspiracy theory I've heard yet. Exactly. <laughs> um, when it comes to um, the award that you got, you got uh, a humanist award, didn't you? Uh, yeah. Um, 2016. I'm and yeah, I'm patron of the Northern Ireland Humanists, which um, is, sounds like it's, it's a wonderful honour, but basically it means I do free gigs for them. <laughs> Tim, would you like to work for nothing? Oh, fantastic. Thank you very much for that wonderful opportunity. Yeah, I did, I did lots of wee gigs for the, for the Humanists. Um, I, I came out as a Humanist, I suppose, four or five years ago. Uh, I'd always been a Humanist anyway, but I kind of came out and did... Uh, I should say it publicly. Uh, that I, tell tell the public a wee bit about what a humanist represents and what you within that means for well, you. The basic thing about, it, about a humanist is a humanist does, believes that uh, morality does not come from any outside source, that there are no gods, uh, and that the human morality does not come from uh, outside sources or gods or Bibles or, or Korans or anything like that, and that where humans make their own morality and that we should be kind and nice to each other. Uh, and we kind of reject religion, well, we reject most religion. And uh, I've, I've always been an atheist, so I've never always thought there was, there was never any God at all. I take the Oscar Wilde point of view, which is that religion was like a blind man in a dark room looking for a black cat that isn't there. And <laughs> Some analogy, Kim. I'm finding it, yeah. So, uh, finding I'm always, it, right? Yeah, finding it. <laughs> what do you think about um, nature as, as God? I actually ha was on a podcast with a lady, uh, Georgie McCafferty, last week, and she uh, is from uh, Dublin. She owns Cornucopia Restaurant in Dublin. She's had fantastic stories. And I was talking to her about nature as God, you know, like naturalistic pantheism is the term yeah. for nature as God. Do you know, do, do you think? You know, considering that we're off and we're stripping back a bit from like constant uh, stimulus of doing, 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 doing all the time. Okay, obviously there are a lot of people that still are key workers and so on, but a lot of people are finding themselves and getting one with nature more and appreciate and stopping literally to look at the birds and the bees, smell the roses and things like that. That's really, really important. Yeah, I, I think there's an element of, 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 can I put this politely, bullshit in that as well? <laughs> <laughs> 
and <laughs> and that humans one of the worst things that we do is we spend our time absolutely destroying nature in every shape form or description of nature isn't really good we've we've abused and used it um i'm one of those people who think that we're here by entirely by an accident and uh, they're very very unlikely to be a planet similar there could be a planet similar to us but we don't know but i mean i think in the long term uh we're likely to destroy this planet we're in the, hopefully long after you and i are gone uh we're likely to destroy the planet and the universe will go on as if we were never there and i mean so obviously when we're, on, when we're on the yeah well we're on the subject um i mean what what's your take on the whole not over like doing it but climate change generally i mean have you got a, a view of you know the. I, I'm pretty. I'm a big fan of Greta. I have to say. I think she's, she's and I think she's wonderful. I think she's really, really good. And I know there's a lot of snipe. And it's very funny. The the people who hate her are tend to be right wing, uh, middle aged men who get very upset at her. Um, and the worst you could say is maybe she's uh, exaggerating how bad the situation is. But most of the science agrees with her. Most of the science says this is getting very, very serious. Look at the wildfires we had in Australia. Look at the uh, the wildfires we have everywhere across America. The ice caps are melting at an alarming rate. The planet is clearly, clearly heating up. And if we don't do something about it, uh, it's, it could be potentially catastrophic. And, and you know, really catastrophic. Um, I so I, 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 I support Greta Thunberg. You know, I think she said that people like me of, of my age have, have destroyed the planet, which is she's probably right. Um, mm-hmm. uh, whether this coronavirus thing will make us all take a bit of a step back and um, reflect a bit more, mm-hmm. uh, I, I would hope so. But I'm, you know, I'm a cynical man. I think as soon as we, we can fly our planes again and, and drink our pints again, we will absolutely well and get into our cars. But it is amazing. I love going for walks around now in North Belfast, and there's virtually no cars right but when i go for a walk of an evening it's amazing you can walk in the middle of the road it's fabulous lovely i'm sure you're enjoying a bit of downtime because you're a very busy man tim so i mean i'm sure that you're welcoming a bit of a break are you i actually am yeah i'm i think i'm fairly self-sufficient i can sit and read papers i like crosswords and reading books and sitting scratching my backside basically and i'm very good at it and <laughs> And trying different wines, you know, that's a of an evening lovely, and watching, lovely, lovely. watching oh, old films. Been watching old Betty Davis films, bizarrely. <laughs> I'm a fan of Betty Davis. We're watching Betty Davis films and old comedies and stuff like that. We went through the the Monty Python collection. Mm-hmm. Well, I was a uh, Monty Python, one of the terminal thing uh, uh, comedies that, that put me onto the, the path of comedy. So I was sitting watching the life of Brian the other night. Was, was oh, what's your favorite? Um, what's your favorite movie? You know that we're on the subject. Uh, well, I'm a big fan of comedy movies. I mean, Life of Brian would certainly be up there. The Producers with uh, Mel Brooks is certainly up there. And I'm, a, I'm afraid I'm an old Godfather fan. The Godfather 2 is still Amazing. one of them. Uh, Amazing. The first one was fantastic. The Godfather 2 is even better. I'm a big fan of that. I actually had never seen it until uh, my partner Jack about six months ago decided that it was time. And I, I cannot believe that I seem to have missed that and I'm 39 years old. Well, you've never seen it well, oh dear. Yeah, so I mean, and yeah, I, I, this is very, very strange because I was always, I, I grew up in a house that was my mom and then loads of men, two brothers and a dad. And, you know, we owned a video shop in the 1980s with independent video stores. So I oh. seen a lot of 80s horror movies where there's men and a lot of destruction and a lot of chaos and a lot of action and yeah. and I know the Godfather was in there but I was obviously too young to really take it all in so I was all into the Rocky and the Top Gun and everything because uh, I had to because my brothers were there Star Wars and things like that but yeah the Godfather just went and then it was just literally six months ago so yeah and the, the soundtrack I actually listened to the soundtrack um, oh, and I could Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, it is. It's it's it's, it's, a, it's a great piece of work, you know. So, your congratulations. You found it up after all these years. I have, yeah. We have to congratulate Jack for for uh, initiating it. Really, you. yeah. So, um, what's your what's your favorite place uh, to eat that you're missing at the minute? Because that's, that's eat? A, yeah. I mean, there's places people think, oh, I can't wait to get back to there, or you know, uh, somewhere that you're thinking, wow, I cannot wait to get back. Yeah, well, there's a, there's a lot of places. Uh, there's a family place that we go to all the time with the, the, the boy, two boys. Um, and they, we would go to Scalini on the, which is kind of cheap and cheerful Italian, but it's really nice service. And the, kind of the people are great and it's just lovely and cheerful. And all. If we if we're going a bit fancier or something like that, we go to James Street South or Hadskies, which is very 
Um, but Scalini, well, once, once, as soon as this is over, we'll, we'll be having a family dinner in Scalini as soon um, as we possible. Any predictions? I know that you're not a psychic with a crystal, a crystal ball right now, but have you any predictions as to when you can I, see this happening now, Tim? I, don't, I genuinely don't. I can't see it happening before sort of autumn time, September. Wow. Genuinely. Before we can get a, a pubs open or anything like that, or go back to football matches and things like that, I really don't. I don't know about theatres at all. We're talking about to to want to do some TV shows, hopefully in September. But again, will we be allowed to bring three hundred people in an audience into the BBC and do a studio? Will we even right. will we have twenty people of a TV crew in a studio? You know, yeah. I don't know. Will we all be wearing bloody masks while doing it? It's so uncertain, isn't it? I know it could be like a whole new slant on things. It's 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 very 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 um, ambiguous at the minute. Um, so if you if you could actually travel, because obviously we're not allowed to travel now at the minute unless under emergency situations. If you could go somewhere right now in the world, where's your happy place, Tim? We, my wife and I, we like to go on city. But I'm not a sun person at all. I don't really like massive heat, but I like cities. So we, our favorite cities are a place like uh, Madrid. Uh, where I would like to go back to is Berlin or Munich. Love German cities, love yeah. German people, think they're fantastic. We were in Berlin a few years ago, really, really impressive city, loved it to bits. And Munich as well, absolutely gorgeous place. So yeah. I would take a nice city break somewhere, uh, somewhere in Europe. I haven't been to Rome for a long, long time as well. I might go back to Rome. But so uh, we, a we sort of four day city break somewhere would just be lovely. I, I agree. I'm not overly into the heat myself. Um, if you if there was one place you haven't been yet, which is on the bucket list to make sure and go to, where would that be at the minute? Oh, Newry. <laughs> you want to go to Newry? Oh, I want to go to Newry. I haven't stayed in Newry. Well, you know, the city breaks and all of that. <laughs> In the Canal Court Hotel, fantastic. <laughs> I'm meant to be interviewing you and I'm just doing nothing but laugh because it's just funny. You're well, you know what? You know what? I've, never, I've never actually been, I've never actually been to Kerry at all. I've never been to County Kerry. You've never been, never been to Kerry. Yeah, I'm quite That's badly so never bizarre. Been to Why not? I know, I don't know. I don't know. I've just never got around it. So I might, I might go down there. Down to the Kerry Ring? Yeah, the Ring of Kerry. The Ring of Kerry. Uh, uh, I would go to. I, I can't go to America until Donald Trump's out of the country uh, or out, out of office. I just, I just can't face it. Uh, but I do always like New York. But uh, I might go somewhere down. I like to go to uh, New Orleans. I'd, go there. I'd love to go to New Orleans as well. I actually about three years ago went to New York. Trump had just got in. I think. Yeah. And it was the coldest winter snap that. New York had faced in 30 years and of course I had to be there frost bit to the hilt um, and the streets were sort of all closing down for the the ball drop at New Year's Eve which we got out of time we literally went there to go and see the Harlem Gospel Choir during the day all right amazing uh, and then we left there and we just we thought everyone's lining the streets ready for the ball drop like 12 hours before it was due to happen ridiculous but the the um, Trump had actually started putting out big, massive, massive lorries um, and, and reinforced army vehicles to prevent attacks going through the centre of the streets. And I thought to myself, this is so, so sensationalised and so glorified and glamorised to the point where I don't want to be part of any of this paranoia and this feeling yeah. of a potential attack. So we just went uh, Upper East Side and went to a lovely little restaurant and just chilled out. And met. We actually were back, I'm telling you more than I should, we were back in the apartment before midnight in bed watching Taxi Driver. And, was <laughs> fine. and that's like, we didn't even have to watch any ball drop and we had a ball. Um, but yeah, Trump, Trump being there at, uh, at this moment, yeah, I can understand why you want to wait for that. Dead romantic story. Thank you for that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I've ever publicly told anybody that. So it was you freezing, so you wouldn't have been long getting frostbite over there now. Awful. It was awful. It was literally, you know, you take your phone out to take a picture. This is lovely. And you take your glove off to touch the phone and your hand. You just oh, think, stop. is it worth it? And then... Yeah. At one point, the, the phone just died because it was just so cold. It was just, I don't think so. This isn't happening. No way. Um, and then I thought, oh, this is great. Like, Jack got me a lovely uh, helicopter ride for the sunset on New Year's Eve over Manhattan. And even the fuel pumps froze, so we couldn't even get up into the air. And I was thinking, okay, well, maybe we could go to 
the Central Park and you know go onto the horses, even they weren't allowed out because it was over minus fifteen, which in a sense obviously is great because the horse shouldn't be out. But the principle of yeah, yeah. romantic trips through Central Park was also great. Right. So like, let's just say that the highlight was Phantom of the Opera. <laughs> Um, so one thing I've always wanted to know um, is what's your earliest memory I'm always really fascinated by by people's memories and the earliest memories can you remember (laughs) your memory Uh, I remember being about three or four at my granny's house um, in Fruit Hill Park in West Belfast and she uh, on Boxing Day because she had a big family do there were about eight, eight of them or, or children in her family and there were about 40 or 50 children gathered in this house and i remember sitting on the stairs and then trying to take a photograph of dozens of these uh of these cousins on really cousins and sitting on a, on a stair uh dressed as a cowboy in a cowboy outfit and i think I'm maybe a bit older than two or three maybe three or four in a cowboy outfit you your, uh, element, with a, your total element with a wee silver with a wee silver gun and holster and stuff uh, and I clearly remember that. And then I, I, my memory is quite bad. Okay, the, the last thing I remember, or the next memory I have, is when I'm six years old. And there were some people doing work in our house. I can't remember the builders or something. We were doing something in the house. And this fella asked me what age I was, and I told him that I was I was five and three quarters, but I was going to be six next month or whatever it was. And I just for some reason that's just very clear in my memory. Going, yeah, I can't wait to be six because five and a half is really really boring or whatever. And it just, <laughs> six was going to be this is it. Finally, I'm going to achieve maturity and manhood or whatever. I don't know what, I, but it's just. It was just so, and did you? <laughs> Not yet, and I'm 55. <laughs> <laughs> no, my mum says when we were walking down the street one day, um, I was, I think, about five, and my mum was turning 35. And the neighbour saw me and mum and said, Oh, hi, are you? I said, It's mummy's birthday today. She's 40. <laughs> <laughs> she says you're oh. a devil like because the thing is i didn't i didn't see i thought that was so older you know that's yeah. why i was kind of saying it in such a way where it was like it was really drastic you know but really when you think about it there's there's no difference in 35 no, 40. <laughs> no certainly not no not when you're 55 yeah <laughs> so you're you're stuck in the house you're in lockdown it's a time when people are sort of getting together and chatting having phone conversations having podcasts potentially and how are you feeling being home and being restricted in, I know that you like to read the papers and you know you're obviously doing the crosswords and drinking your wine and things like that but you know are you are you really finding it okay the whole thing and are you really looking forward to get out there you just hate people <laughs> no I know I, I quite like people you know in small doses like you know but I think <laughs> Uh, there are things I, I'm, I'm, I'm quite content, but I don't want it to go on too long. But I, I mean, the weather's helping as well. The weather is being lovely, and I, we've got a wee bit of a back garden, so we can sit out in the back and, and you know, have lovely. a cup of tea, read the paper, which is lovely. And I genuinely, it's taken a couple of weeks, but I've kind of realised this is like a holiday. <laughs> it's like because I do, I don't do work too, but I, I work, my year is kind of planned out from stage show to TV show to gigs all the time and they've all just gone and as I say, I, I, as I say the diary is just completely empty for the next while you know all these gigs and I do a lot of stand up and after dinners and stuff and they just all disappear so I literally have nothing to do for the foreseeable future until somebody tells me I can leave the house uh, so it's, it's like an enforced holiday I mean there, there's bits you'd love to go to the pub and you'd love to go get in your car and drive to Donegal or something oh, but I mean I'm, I'm quite content really you know I'm, I'm, I'm we're, 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 you know, I've got a good wife and two children. You know, we're all we're all fairly get, getting on fairly well. We haven't stabbed each other yet, and uh, <laughs> it's 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 all right. I hope it doesn't go on too long, but you know, we're, I'm okay at the moment. And would you do? Would you never consider doing something like the comedy kitchen or something like that? I, I've been asked to do a couple. Of, I've done a couple of wee videos and stuff. Uh, I don't. I've put stuff online. Uh, I was asked by something. It was the, something to do with the Department of Health about you know making sure you stay at home and wash your hands and all of that. And I have to do a couple more wee videos. I don't think I would do a full show or whatever because I think genuinely, if, if you're writing new jokes, you want them to. You want a to try them out to real people and then b hone it down. And I think if you're doing it in your kitchen, you won't get the reaction to it. You won't get the 
timing, you won't get the rhythm of it, you won't get the so of it. And all of that is completely vital to comedy. Uh, and I don't, I think you, you might just throw stuff out and go, oh no, I just wasted that, you know. I'm, I, I, I'm desperate, I, would, I, would, do, I genuinely miss standing with a microphone in my hand telling jokes to people. I do really like that. And I'm hoping once this is all up and out of the way, I'll do a couple of wee gigs in some of the, the great wee comedy clubs that there are knocking about Belfast. There are a lot more of them now. The, the Empire is, of course, the old one and the classic and the best. But there are lovely wee ones then Lavery's Bar, run by Colin Geddes and one in Pug Ugly's beautiful room upstairs. Pug Ugly's Bar, uh, run by Dave Elliott, a lot of lovely wee clubs. And there's nothing better than going out there and doing sort of 30 minutes or half an hour or hour, 40 minutes or whatever. And uh, I genuinely miss that. And if it goes on much longer, I will turn my head. <laughs> the one thing I need an Alice band. That's easy. An Alice band. Yeah, that's <laughs> <laughs> I can't get my hair cut. Ah, that's right. Would you not just get like your wife or someone to do it? No, no, no. no, no. There's nothing wrong with it. We wouldn't let her near me with knives or shit. Yeah, it's getting a bit long. I, don't know. I think it's go nice. For the it. look. Yeah, you can go for just the, the rough, rough, rough and rugged look. <laughs> and what about um, if you say, for example, you had your life to live over and you had a different career uh, path that you would have went? Have you ever thought of that? Have you ever thought, well, you know, I, I would have been good at that? And, uh, and you see, I, I am quite lucky because we did actually have another career. I was a solicitor for a long time. Yeah, uh, yeah. Right, you did your research very well there, Shal. Well <laughs> I did not know. I'm going to be totally honest. <laughs> I'm immersed in your uh, uh, business side of things. Uh, and no, no, I was, a, I was a solicitor in private practice, and then I worked in uh, anti-discrimination law, in sex discrimination, and religious discrimination law. I worked for the Fair Employment Commission and the Equal Opportunities Commission, and totally, oh. yeah. Uh, and I really enjoyed that. I was quite good at that. Uh, but mm, lawyer, I wouldn't really want to go back and do the law again. If I wasn't doing this, what would I like to do? Um, I would. I'd, you know, I'd like to be a travel writer. I'd like to travel more and do writing and travel. I'd like to do that. That sounds amazing. Yeah. That's the only thing I haven't really. I haven't been quite. But, but I've done bits and pieces of travel, but I haven't been to Africa. I haven't been to Asia. I haven't been anywhere. And I'd like to do a wee bit more of that. And I'd like to write about places. Yeah. Get, what I mean is get people to pay me to go to places and then write about it. <laughs> That's what you mean. Nice food, I mean. uh, yeah. nice food, <laughs> all the rest of it. That would be amazing. Um, yeah, but, so. Um, just before we we finish rounding up here, thanks so much for taking the time to to chat with me today. It's the sort of thing where I've been wanting to do this for quite some time and have a chat with you, and then it's really great to be able to do this. Um, what's the one thing that you would be working on yourself at the moment? What would be now that you've got a bit of headspace and? What do you mean working on? <laughs> Working on you know yourself in in a way. Is there any particular like area that you're developing or uh, looking work wise or or, or personal personally whatever, <laughs> whatever. yeah uh, no well at the moment what I'm trying to do is uh, I, we're we're we were in the company, the Home and Wall Gang, we're in negotiations with the BBC about bits and pieces and we hope that there'll be, for instance, a few more episodes to give me a piece and stuff like that. But what I'm actually starting to do, because of a bit more time, every day I'm setting aside a bit of time just sort of writing jokes, just writing lots of new jokes. So I think one stage, hopefully, uh, probably next year by the time I'd, I'd like to do a, a new one-man show because I haven't done a one-man show. I did a couple of shows. I did one about Irish history, and I did one about uh, 1916, about the Easter Rising and the Battle of the Somme. And I'd like to do another one-man show. Um, I think I'm calling it Tim McGarry Needs a Hug. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> yeah. I actually went to the history one uh, of yours. That was a bit, was that a year ago? or? Oh, no, it was a whole lot of years ago. <laughs> Which one did you do most recently in the stand-up on your own in the Opera House? Uh, no, that was that was the history one. That was a long time ago. Yeah, yeah. I'm years literally are flying into the point that I, yeah, yeah. Like about seven or eight years ago, and then I did the uh, I did the one about 1916. Tim McGarry goes over the top about the Easter Rising and the Battle of Somme stuff. But the oh. history one was probably the one in the Opera House because I did the the 1961 the lyric and, and all over the well all over the place. But yeah, so I'd like, I'd like to write a new show. Um, basically telling people to cheer up as well, even though I do need a hug, but pointing out all the nice things that are happening in Northern Ireland, people exactly. stop the I know everyone will be hugging the 
bones off everybody hopefully <laughs> um, and and also like have you got a favorite memory of a show or a piece or a skit that you've done that you just stands out as being the pinnacle of why you do what you do well that's a that's a tough question man. that is a tough i i i suppose uh i mean there's loads of bits that give me a piece uh that are just wonderful to rewatch. and uh but i think one of the highlights of my career it has to be being on stage at the time uh, the, the blame game uh hosting the blame game in derry the time diego came did the flags thing uh but the, the flags thing is the thing that everybody remembers from from and indeed that series. And about it. it was a marvelous piece. And Jake was wonderful. But the whole show was just a really, really good show. And a really, it was the Millennium Theatre in Derry was absolutely bombed. I've done bigger shows, but it was just a lovely, lovely theatre, a lovely TV show, and everything just came together. And everything about it just went, ah, oh, this is just a joy. And it's one of those things you're doing, you're not even I'm working, but I'm not working because I'm enjoying myself so much. I was one of those. Yeah. I just, I, I, even after it was, it sounds very arrogant to go, I'm quite good at this, aren't I? You know? <laughs> <laughs> well, you are, but and that, that's well, why I people go to see you, and that's why they're sold out shows, and, you know, and we're all looking back, uh, looking forward to going back to see you really, really soon, and thank you so much well, for uh, uh, your time. If, if, if Blame Game comes back, strictly off the record, you can give contact me, I'll get you a couple of free tickets. Lovely. That sounds even better. <laughs> Thank you very much. Great, I, I need some reflexology and return or acupuncture or something. What is it you do? Both. <laughs> <laughs> we'll work something out. We'll definitely. work something out. And there'll definitely be a hug or two in there at the same time. Thank Perfect. you very much, Tim. Really, really appreciate your time. Great. You're Take very care. welcome. Bye-bye.